lawyer showing you uh, this, do not use this report, suggesting there was something nefarious going on here. And then you saw the truth, right? That this related to Dr. Lewin's testing of baby powder, the one where he, in his second test, said there was no asbestos in Johnson's baby powder. And they showed you Macron. A few tremolite rods were observed in both samples at a level less than a fraction of a percent. And they said no asbestos, no chrysotile, as Dr. Lewin had pointed out, was there. And then Macron, knowing this was going to the FDA, as you saw, but great lab that they were, they said they did a follow up. <coughs> and they said before, basically before we say the weight, the level, let's make sure, and they say we've not been able to substantiate the levels originally reported. And so this is what went to the FDA. Same report, right? Same as the do not use. And it says, instead of saying there's basically almost no travel light, what J and J tells the FDA, and this goes to the FDA, submission to the FDA, 72. What J and J tells the FDA Instead of saying we have almost none, we say we have a few tremolite rods in both samples. Not that we have almost no tremolite. Right? We say we have tremolite rods. It's actually worse for J&J. But they want to make it sound like something nefarious is going on, right? Do not use. Okay? This is, we told the FDA it's not the worst because we're told that we can't substantiate the levels. And then you saw there was a lot of discussion about the Rubino study. And Jane Day funded that first Rubino study. Dr. Rubino was the Italian um, scientist who did a study of the millers and miners in uh, Italy, uh, in, first in 1976 and then one in 79. And there was some suggestion that Jane Jay uh, influenced or dictated or somehow wrote this paper for him. You heard that his English was not his first language, and, and he had debriefed, as you heard, J and J on his results. And so J and J suggested a discussion and conclusion section. But then you heard Dr. Rubino through his translator intermediary. He said basically, thanks, but no, thanks, but no, thanks. It was impossible to use your discussion and conclusion. I'm not taking it. And then you see that Rubino's work is a sound statistical study. The method used and the results presented with absolute objectivity, objectivity will certainly be accepted by everybody. They're very, they are very important. No evidence that J&J &J had any influence at all. In fact, as you saw, some of Dr. Rubino's results were bad for J&J. &J. The Myers and Millers were dying from dust disease, not from cancer, not from mesothelioma, but from pneumoconiosis and talcosis. So if we were trying to rig a study, do you think we'd come out with a great study? No, it shows the millers and miners were getting this horrible dust disease. They weren't getting cancer from these high exposures. And then they claim that we funded, j and funded the second Rubino study. It was a budget line item for it, but then ultimately, here's the evidence, Defense Exhibit 8413. There is no interest in such a study at our end. We already have the 76 study. Remember, Dr. Vino did another study with a different control group. We had nothing to do with the second study. No interest in such a study on our end. And then, Dr. Vino, or just an intermediary, as a courtesy, gave us a pretty publication draft, a JJ pretty publication draft of his second study. And there was a suggestion that somehow J and J took out deaths. Do you remember that? Not the truth. Not supported by the evidence. I'm going to show you what you saw in the trial. Remember they showed you this graph about these cancers? And then compared to the final report, you saw that all of the causes All cause deaths were the same. The numbers were the numbers were the same in all cause. So the published paper, which is at the bottom, same numbers, 560, 560, 4469, 
125, 193, 16 percent. All cause deaths were fully reported. And Rubino's final paper said the same thing as his first paper. In conclusion, our findings show there's no relationship that has been found between Italian top exposure and cancer, whereas pneumoconiosis may be observed. No cancer. But the dust, we know they got tons of exposure because they had this pneumoconiosis, the scarring in the lungs. And then there was a suggestion <coughs> that, uh, remember uh, Mr. Penner <coughs> suggesting Dr. Hopkins, somehow you influenced Dr. Rubino from keeping out mention of these other larynx, esophageas, <coughs> stomach cancer, but then you looked at the first paper on the same Millers and Miners. Every single one of those deaths was reported. Every single one of those deaths, and we walk through this chart, see, the uh, long bronchial, esophageal, stomach, all reported in the peer review published literature. Again, any the suggestions, the allegations, just not fair, not supported by the evidence. It's all in there for people to see. And that's the one J&J &J funded. They reported all the deaths and, and the reasons. And you saw in the pre-publication draft, and you saw Dr. Diaz say there was these other deaths because of alcohol consumption, cirrhosis of the liver, esophageal and stomach cancer related to heavy drinking uh, from the minors. Allegations not supported by the evidence. Then they accused Dr. I'm sorry, they accused the guy, Roger Miller. Uh, they also uh, doing something funny with the numbers in the minor and Miller studies, remember that? Then we showed you our demonstrative and, and compared it with the World Health Organization organization numbers. And they matched sure they were the same, except I had actually left off, and Dr. Pia had actually left off 418. We undercounted the number of people actually studied. Then they showed you in their cross with Dr. Pia. Remember Dr. Pia was the epidemiologist. And, and he was the only epidemiologist called in this case. Ask yourself why they didn't bring expert on disease causation. We're in the middle of a place where there are fortunately are tons of doctors. New York, Philadelphia, here in New Brunswick, Washington DC, Baltimore, Boston. There are epidemiologists over the very profession that studies the causes of disease. They didn't bring you one. They're the only ones who brought you a disease causation expert. Someone that studies uh, does studies on disease causation, whether substance causes the disease absence of proof on this. And then Dr. Diet was cross-examined about this and saying, oh, you, you guys said there's 7,000 minors in Miller studies. You're double counting for everything. Well, I count Chris and Chris and me and then they count them again. But then you saw it's just simple math. It's just adding the numbers, the actual numbers in each of the studies and Counting the number that's uh, 67 years for Italy, 26 for Vermont, it's actually should be 93, how many years they were studying. And Dr. Dia, they clear, reminds them of this, is that Dr. Rubino study was on the same Miller and Minor group twice, different cohort, and then it's good to study a group twice. You get more information. You learn uh, more about the validity of your results. He also said that thousands, half or more, were studied only, only once. And so, again, Allegations and suggestions not consistent. They accused poor Roger Miller, who ran the Windsor Vermont mine, of perjury. Remember that? Yeah, she said perjury. Got a lot of nerve after Dr. Longo swore seven times that he never tested out before this lawsuit came out on the truth. But here is um, Dr. This is um, Roger Miller's affidavit that they showed you, and he said in this lawsuit. No evidence of the presence of asbestos in Windsor Mine product has ever been revealed by this testing. And you know why he said it? It was the truth. Here is McCall's report. And Roger Miller, this is July 1987. McCall is 
sending this in May 87, just a few months before. And McCrone is telling Roger Miller, copy on this, the same guy who signed the affidavit, that's why the world is telling them that Windsor product is free of asbestos. That has always been our opinion and continues to be our opinion based on 15 years of closely examining the product. The best lab in the world is telling the head of J&J's line that they don't have any asbestos in their finished product. And based on that, Roger Miller told this. Because it was the truth. Then they, remember Nancy Muscle, the burn new nurse, whose video was up there, and they asked her again and again about this answers in interrogatories. And when you get sued, the way Jane Jane has uh, again and again. And they pointed out that in this response, in this one lawsuit, Dr. Musto, with assistance from attorneys, when she signed this report, this answer, the question was, describe in detail all process procedures and testing performed upon the talc used in the manufacture of Johnson's baby powder to reduce or eliminate the existence of asbestos, tremoline, or other contaminants in Johnson's baby powder. And the answer was, to the best of defendant's knowledge, talc used in the manufacture of Johnson's baby powder never contained asbestos in any form or tremoline. Well, somebody messed up. As we told the FDA, as you saw, we did have trace amounts of tremoline. But somebody meant to say tremoline is asbestos. But the fact that somebody messed up, some lawyer or whoever helped answer, the fact that somebody messed up answering hundreds of different interrogatory answers from lawsuits, the fact that somebody made a mistake doesn't mean there's asbestos in alpha powder. And they say that. It never contained asbestos. It did contain trace amounts of tremoline, so that was wrong. Somebody made a mistake. But that doesn't mean that there's asbestos in baby powder. And I'm sure you'll hear about that in your closing. <coughs> Then they showed you this document. Remember the discussion about the animal testing? And there was a suggestion, oh, you did all this special testing for the animals that you didn't do for the people, and you made sure that the animal stuff was clean so, uh, so you would look good in these studies. Not the truth, not the evidence. Here's the document. 228P. Was not, and you, you do test and you do trace a lot. If something was wrong, you want to know where those where it came from. So they did segregate, did they know where the stuff came from. But then you saw this note. They pulled it out of the regular production lot. It's a lot baby powder, cows you can't set aside for everybody to do everything. They pulled it out of the regular production line. And that's the point. It's the same baby powder used by everybody. It's clean. There's no asbestos. They pulled it right out of the production line. They're tracking it for the animal studies. There is not a single, as you have heard Dr. Katniss and Dr. Diet talk about our two causation experts, uh, and Dr. Katniss is one of the world-leading experts on this. They didn't bring you a single expert who's published one study on peritoneal mesothelioma. Not one. None of their experts have published anything in the scientific literature. I've done no research or published on um, mesothelioma. Dr. Tannis has published the biggest study on peritoneal mesothelioma. He's published other studies on peritoneal mesothelioma. That's why he's on these international boards when you have hard diagnoses for mesothelioma. That's why he's on the U.S. and Canadian board and on the international board. He is one of the world's leading experts in mesothelioma, and particularly peritoneal mesothelioma. And Dr. Diet is not only a pulmonologist, but also an environmental exposure expert. They didn't bring you either one of those kinds of experts. And he's also an epidemiologist. They didn't bring you one of those disease causation. And both Dr. Tanus and Dr. Diaz talk about the fact that there is not a single study, not even a case report, not even a crappy study. There's no study that says J and J caused mesothelioma in anybody. There's none. In fact, there's no published study that says J&J has a product that has asbestos in it. There's nothing in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. A product that's been on the market for 125 years. 
been on the market for people to test for years. Not a single, what are the chances? There's a bad study about everything. Apples, coffee, anything. There's not a single study in the peer-reviewed published literature that J&J &J baby powder causes mesothelioma or has asbestos. Not that says J&J. &J. They want to suggest, well, oh, this one is about J&J. &J. No, there's nothing in the paper that says J&J. &J. Because that's the truth. There's no science. There's no evidence. They want to use this study by uh, Dr. Gordon. He's a plaintiff's expert, which they've acknowledged, a plaintiff's expert in lawsuits. It's a study funded uh, and paid for by attorneys for lawsuits. And it's about a product that's not Johnson & Johnson. It's cashmere bouquet, not J&J. &J. Why don't they bring a study about J&J? Because there is none. Then they showed you a document created by the plaintiff's lawyers. They have a plaintiff's number, I think, for IDs. It's 7506, 69. And they're claiming that this testing board, oh, look, all of this shows that there's asbestos in Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. It's not the truth. First of all, most of it doesn't even say asbestos. It says ampable, tremolite, aminolite, the good rock. Then you saw that they put stuff up here when the underlying testing documents say on their face, there's no asbestos. Why are they doing that? If you have real evidence, why do you have to do that? Why do you put stuff in there where it says no asbestos? And so just to give you an example of what some of what was going on here, January 30th, 87. Here it is. They say ample will ample, suggesting that that's asbestos, right? But then you look at the January 30th paper, the test, it says no fibrous forms are observed. No asbestos. So it's the complete opposite of what they're suggesting to you. Why do they do that? If you have real evidence, why do you have to do that? March 30th, 87, same. Put it up here, ample will suggesting that that's asbestos. Then you look at March 30th, 87. Test result. No fibrous form observed. No asbestos. Not supported by the evidence. And then one other example, there's plenty we went through with Dr. Hopkins, but in the interest of time, we'll go to September 72. <coughs> Straight up fragments, non asbestos people. And then they talk about 
the other part of the another government report, 9053, you guys have seen this. They talk about, again, they show you what the ampelite and trumpelite asbestos looks like, right? That's the hairy, the hairy kind of rock. And they talk about the fact that cleated fragments, talk about the fact that just because it's fibrous, it's not asbestos in here, the term fiber is not limited to asbestos. They talk about how the fibers, there are fibers not asbestos form things. When fibers talc doesn't make them harmful or more asbestos. And then they talk about cleavage fragments. That's what they look like, right? And how cleavage fragments are not asbestos, right? However, because they this is a government, these fragments can be elongated. However, because they did not uh, grow as fibers, they did not have the same characteristics as fibers. Characteristically, cleavage fragments are not all fibers. They distinguish. And maybe some of you remember when Mr. Panettiere handed out these pictures to you, claiming this is asbestos, this is asbestos. Maybe some of you noticed this. And I want to just put it up. This is. And I'm going to identify it as uh, M69042-002BL-001. <coughs> and we showed you this, suggesting it was asbestos. But look what the analysts at Dr. Longo's lab wrote. They didn't write anthopolite asbestos, did they? They didn't write asbestos at all. They just said anthopolite. And you know you can have the good anthopolite and you can have the anthopolite asbestos. And they didn't write anthopolite asbestos. Why do you think they didn't bring those testers here the ones who actually did the test? They don't find Maybe some of you notice on the second picture the same thing. <coughs> it doesn't say asbestos. It just says anthopolite. It doesn't look anything like what the government report says anthopolite asbestos look like. It's not the hairy rock. So I submit to you the plaintiff's case is based on confusion and based on cherry picking lines out of the document without showing you the truth. And we disclose your submission to the FDA. Remember, Mr. Panettiere had it, and he still has it over there, the inbox, health box, right? This is what went to the FDA, what went to the world. We told them, we told the FDA we have some tremolite. Not a specific form, but we have it. Told the FDA, submission, other submissions to the FDA, that we have tremolite and actinolite. We told them about the tremolite rods. It wasn't a secret. It was disclosed to the FDA. In fact, we told the FDA, we didn't think it was asbestos, but if you want to, you want to consider it, we said, this talc contains essentially no anthopolite and only minor amounts below 1% of tremolite and actinolite, or in other words, contains less than 1%, if any, asbestos particles. We didn't think it was, but if you want to say it's asbestos particles, we have it. We, we told the FDA, that was part of the disclosures, to su suggest that J&J was hiding that, not the truth. We told the FDA, fully disclosed. We told the FDA when they were considering regulations I guess some companies have suggested you can wash out asbestos. We said that is not true. We told the FDA the assumptions we believe to be incorrect are as follows that how can we process to remove asbestos? We told them you can't wash it out. That's why we did all this testing for it. Fully disclosed to the FDA what was in our product and that you could that mess this up here. I'm frozen. I'm frozen. Oh, oh there we go. Then you saw that there were different definitions in the government. Actually, the government had constant definitions. And you saw and one of the things, again, so I submit the plaintiff's case is based on confusion. And it's confusing. They're trying to confuse you between what is regular old good rocks that you see in the environment every day and harmful stuff. But then you saw that just because it says amplable, most rocks are not asbestos. Overwhelmingly, majority, 99 point something percent of rocks are not asbestos. And that's true for their experts acknowledge that 
Chemolite does not necessarily mean asbestos. Anthopolite does not mean asbestos necessarily. And actinolite does not mean asbestos because there's two kinds of those things. And the EPA, OSHA, the, mineral, the, the Mining Safety and Health Agency all make a distinction. All of them agree with Jane Jay's position in this case and with Dr. Attendance's position that there's a difference between asbestos tremolite, asbestos anthopolite, and asbestos actinolite. And to be asbestos, to be the harmful kind, it has to be the asbestos form kind. And why define, ask yourself, if they say it doesn't matter, right? Dr. Weber said it doesn't matter, it's 31. Then why do all these government agencies and testing, like, why do they define it? Why do they say it has to be the asbestos form? But it doesn't matter. Because it does matter. And OSHA, the government did a fairly extensive analysis that we looked at, looking at all the science on um, asbestos and on non-asbestos, anthopolite and tenolite and tenolite, these good rocks, and they concluded, looking at the human studies, looking at the animal studies, looking at cell studies, they concluded, this is the government again, people that have no interest in this case, right? OSHA has made a determination that substantial evidence is lacking to conclude that non-asbestic form tremolite, anthopolite, and actinolite present the same type or magnitude of health effects as asbestos. So the government disagrees with plaintiff's case. They say you have to look, you have to know whether it's asbestos or not, because the non-asbestos kind of rock is not harmful. And it's not just OSHA, multiple government agencies have looked at this issue. Here's the uh, Department of Interior testing some talc and saying, the tremolite fragment noted in the report is not asbestos, but rather normal rock-forming amphibole, which is ubiquitous in the Earth's crust. Regular old tremolite, they're saying, is not asbestos. Normal. FDA agrees. They searched the literature without success to find any report on the toxicity of tremolite. FDA knows we have tremolite. Occasionally, we had it uh, as an invisible fragment, like all of us breathe every day. And they say, no evidence is toxic. Same thing for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. No evidence of a hazard from non-asbestos cleavage fragments. In fact, studies dealing with non-asbestos form tremolite or other cleavage fragments have not thus far shown any indication of a carcinogenic health hazard. They don't agree with the plaintiff's case in government that cleavage fragments three to one are harmful. And why, maybe some of you thought about this, why if they're claiming there's asbestos in baby powder, are they talking about the It's like plan B. They can't tell you that there's asbestos. Oh, let's let's argue that the, the good rock's bad. They're arguing about cleavage fragments because there's no asbestos in the baby powder and they know it. That's why I'm, why would they bring up this whole cleavage fragment thing? Dr. Blount, we looked at, she disagrees with them. No good evidence for adverse effects of these regular <coughs> and here's an example, you, you looked at a cleavage fragment, you mash it up, it could have the same ratio if you mash it up as an asbestos fiber, three to one, it doesn't make it asbestos. Their experts agree. Just because you, met, you take non-asbestos tremolite and crush it up, that doesn't magically make it asbestos. That's correct. And that would be the same for anthopolite, actinolite, non-asbestos rocks like tremolite. Just because you mash it up, it doesn't magically become and but that's the trick here. That's the plaintiff's experts' trick. I submit to you. What they're doing is calling the regular old good rock asbestos because they have to because there's no asbestos in baby powder or shower shower. And they actually admit it to you, the cost examination, that that's what they're doing. That the structure. So it was the same picture we just looked at. That the structure comes from breaking apart non-asbestos tremolite. You would agree with me that it does not magically, in fact, become asbestos. Yes, sir, or agree. But you would count it and report it in your report as asbestos. If your hypothetical is true, yes. They would report as asbestos even if it's not. And Dr. Compton agreed the same thing. You ask me to assume it's not, I would count it even though you're telling me it's not. That's the trick. That is the trick. Maybe some of you got it earlier. They are calling non-asbestos, regular old cleavage fragment rocks that we encounter every day in our yards, outside in the world. They're calling it asbestos. 
in and of its own. That is the lawsuit trick their experts are selling. Why would they have to call, why would they have to talk about cleavage drive? Because they're really fine to discuss this. And then Dr. Longo detailing here, their thirty-one million dollar guy. So the government makes me count. It made me count. Even if it's not as best as this three to five to one, they make me count. Well, that's not the truth. The government doesn't make him count. The government says they're easily distinguishable. Cleavage fragments are easily distinguishable from true asbestos. Using these microscopic techniques, PLM, you can tell the difference. You can tell that hairy rock from a straight up cleavage fragment. And the uh, regulation, for purposes of the regulation, the mineral must be one of the six. There must be asbestos and mineral have it. And they, they, they make fun, oh, we don't ask the rock how they grow. You don't have to ask the rock. You can see, is it a hairy rock or not? That's the point. That's why the government defines it differently. And you heard Dr. Atanas talk about how dimensions matter, how there's fiber strength is asbestos that you don't find in the right? so they break apart more easily so you can exhale them like we exhale all kinds of dust with counter every day. That's why there is a difference. And Dr. Longo's own testing method, he testified he used the ISO, the San Industry Reference, the testing standard organization's method. But then we looked at the definitions with him. His own standard makes him discriminate. You can't. The government doesn't make him count. His own testing standard doesn't make him count. It says it's necessary to discriminate between the asbestos form and non asbestos form analogs. You got is this the hairy rock, the bad one? Or is this just regular old stuff we see every day, invisible, ultra trays, microscopic, that all of us inhale and breathe out every day? You gotta tell the difference. There's a big difference. Something's going on in Dr. Longo's lab, right? You guys saw this? This error rate test? How could it be? How could it be that people in his lab are seeing absolutely nothing in a sample, and other people are seeing a whole bunch of bundles? What kind of lab is that? Some people are seeing fibers, some people are seeing nothing, some people are seeing bundles. Only one sample they all agreed on. 91% error rate in this test. What's going on there? Then you, you heard this. Dr. Longo's lab in seven, I'm sorry, eight samples of Johnson's baby powder. We found asbestos, right? But then he sent it out to another plaintiff's lab, and even that lab said, you know what, what did you think? There ain't no asbestos here. There's nothing. How can that be? I got looked at it longer. Well, then you saw there wasn't enough hours in the day to do what Dr. Longo claimed he did. You heard about this. Something's going on in that lab, right? FDA said there were some problems. I didn't want to talk about them. FDA audited Dr. Longo's dent lab. They found problems. I didn't want to talk about them. And picture after picture, he sat here and said, that's asbestos, that's asbestos. Well, one of them said asbestos. You heard Dr. Hopkins, you saw the test results. When you find asbestos, you write asbestos. Macron wrote asbestos, tremolite, not asbestos, and thopolite, not anthopolite, asbestos. And then you look, this is an evidence. This is Defense Exhibit 89 Look at what the government pictures of asbestos look like, right? Tremolite asbestos. It's nothing like Dr. Longo, what Dr. Longo was saying asbestos is. It's nothing like it, because it's not. It's practiced in a regular, microscopic, almost invisible, almost not medical traces of the good rock. Look there, I have no problem with that. Is it me or is it you? Probably me. There you go, I'm sorry. Uh, and here is a, uh, another government document. Did they show you a picture, the hairy rock? Anthopolite asbestos. Dr. Wong was saying this is an anthopolite bundle. It looks nothing like it. it. Looks nothing like it at all. In fact, his investigators just say it's regular old anthopolite. Why did they bring him here to talk to you? Government says here's a picture of a cleaving fragment. It looks just like what Dr. Wong was saying is asbestos, right? But the government says it's a cleavage fragment. It looks just like what Dr. Wong was saying is Another example. Government says cleavage fragment. Dr. Longo says it's asbestos. It looks nothing like asbestos. What's going on here? The difference between science and the real world, the loss of fiction, the loss of story without evidence. 
Maybe they can believe, maybe Dr. Walton can go get some jurors to believe what he's telling them. Maybe not this year. Folks here are not that naive. That comment is stricken from the record. Use your common sense and ask yourself, ask yourself, how could it be that the most common of products, hundreds of millions of people use Johnson's house and car? How could it be that one of the most common, one of, one of the most widely used products in history, over 125 years, causes the rarest, rarest? <coughs> Dr. Diaz, or it would be a super rare, less than one in a million. How can it be that the most common of products causes the most uncommon? Almost nobody, less than a million a year, 300 people a year, super rare. And ask yourself when you look at the government SEER data, Dr. Diaz says their time here doesn't add up. But they're right that diapering a baby from zero to three years with baby powder causes mesothelioma, which is their point. Then how, how can you have a graph like this? The average latency is 20 to 40 years. Dr. Diaz, you can expect this spike to be right up here, right? After 20, 30, 40 years, it's not here. It should be, it doesn't make any sense. It'll be right up here. Where are the mesotheliomas on this graph? If what they're saying is true. That exposure from zero to three with a latency of 20 to 40 years, you'd see that spike way, way sooner. <coughs> but Dr. Hayes said it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Not consistent with the science. They claim that mesothelioma is a signal tumor, has to be from asbestos. And I think they showed you a document from some, some, somebody at JJ that actually said, said something like that. But that makes hundreds of scientists, thousands of people. But somebody said something in that document that's wrong. Doesn't make it right. And all the scientific studies you look at showed that asbestos exposure in peritoneal meso is far less obvious. Far less obvious. It's not a single tumor when it comes to the adult. Published paper, this is the one by both, both sides experts, Dr. Tanis and an expert for the plaintiff, you saw that splitter. Both sides experts agree. And you know, Dr. Tanis, unlike the plaintiff's expert, has published in the peer-reviewed literature. He's subjected his opinions to peer-reviewed scientific scrutiny. And they say, yes, this is reliable, we're going to publish it. None of their experts have published anything on peritoneal these are the women's models. And what this peer-reviewed paper by both sides experts say is that in approximately 60 to 90 percent of these in U.S. women, plural 60, 90 percent in peritoneal, and a substantial portion of peritoneal measles in men are, un are likely unrelated to asbestos. It's a paper by both sides experts, unrelated to asbestos. And it goes on to say that historically peritoneal measles feelings were associated with heavy commercial chemicals, asbestos exposure, sex exposure are now uncommon, and currently the epidemiological evidence correlating time training trends, incidents at both sexes, and asbestos exposure suggests that a much smaller fraction of tumors in men are related to asbestos. Very so it's more likely than not that peritoneal music is not related to asbestos, according to the science. Darren? Can you get any quicker? Oh, you yeah, have um, Then this study, 22 leading experts on mesothelioma. Recent, hot off the presses. Cancer journal. And easily, and, and I think the is, well, this isn't from <coughs> Mount Sloan Kettering or Mount Sinai. Well, it's from all of the leading experts from these institutions. And these guys and gals, they're not here, they're published, they're not here with lawsuits, they're publishing a paper trying to help people hear treatment suggestions for doctors, right? 21 of them have no, 20, 20, I think there was a defense expert and a plaintiff's expert on the paper in the disclosure. 20 of them have no interest in the litigation at all. Memorial Sloan Kettering doctor, Mount Sinai doctor, Harvard doctor, Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, Rutgers, Robert Wood, University of California, some of the best medical institutions in the world these folks are from. Right, they're paper to try to help people, and in the peer-reviewed science, they're reliable, determined to be reliable and, and publishable, they say that peritoneal mesothelioma is rarely associated with asbestos exposure. That's what the leading experts, most recent study, the peritoneal is rarely associated. Only 8% of 
recorded exposure. Way more likely than not that peritoneal mesothelial is not caused by asbestos exposure. According to this brand new study from some of the leading experts in the field from some of the best cancer uh, centers in the world. Um, and then you saw in the, even in the document they rely on, the Helsinki criteria, even their experts acknowledge, typically with peritoneal mesothelial the abdominal crime, you need really heavy exposure. Right, if you heard Dr. Tan, you said, Chris, you've got to get it all the way. You have to overcome all of our body's defenses about expelling these fibers and getting down all the way into the peritoneal uh, area. And so the papers talk about heavy, heavy exposure. And here, they're not allowed to, they're not allowed to trace. Doesn't add up, right? How are you going to get down? You've got 17 million, so even if they're right and they're not, there's asbestos. How does trace a heavy enough exposure to cause peritoneal mesothelioma? When typically you see it in insulation workers, people have heavy daily exposure to this. And you talk, you've heard a lot about biomarkers in this case. And that is, a, and their own experts have admitted biomarkers are objective evidence. It's something the juries can look at and say, yes, there's evidence of asbestos exposure. Is there evidence in the CAT scans? Is there evidence in the lungs? Is there evidence in the x-ray? Is there evidence in the tissue? Are there, t are there fibers in the tissue? And I can say, aha, that person was exposed to asbestos. And if you breathe, and you, know, you heard the experts, if you breathe enough asbestos, you get scarring. You can't get scarring in your lungs, or you get asbestos evidence that you've been exposed, because you're working so hard, right, to get uh, to expel fibers. You have that evidence, and their experts said you look for it. That Helsinki criteria that they rely on, remember, they say you look for it. Where's the biological evidence? You folks are looking for evidence when you're deciding this case. Where's the evidence that these plants were exposed? And Dr. Diaz told you that the overwhelming majority of people with peritoneal meso, because of the heavy exposure, they have these biomarkers. Because it takes so much exposure to get through the lungs and overcome our filter systems. And then you saw the published studies agree. In plural, you got 70%. This is a textbook by Dr. Wadley. Your hurries work for plaintiffs and defendants. And then the leading expert study we just looked at by the 22 people from Mount Sinai and other uh, Harvard, Sloan Kettering. Plural class are frequent in patients with meso, for example, there are around 88% of asbestos exposed patients with mesothelium. More recent studies, because the skin is more sensitive, you've heard Dr. Yeh talk about, you're seeing a higher percentage. And here you heard that not a single plaintiff or plaintiff alleging, not alleging, or plaintiff suffering from peritoneal mesothelioma, which the literature says you need heavy exposure to get, not a trace of biological evidence, no evidence in their lungs, no evidence in their tissue, no evidence of any scarring in their lungs, no evidence that any of them were exposed to asbestos at all. How is that possible? Why does your common sense say that? How is it possible when you hear 88%, the overwhelming majority, 70%, the overwhelming majority of people with peritoneal mesa have a marker, the scarring or some asbestosis or something in their lungs or the tissue? And all four of these plaintiffs have nothing, no biological evidence at all. And Dr. Waleen, even their expert, admitted they don't, not one of them. Even So both sides' experts agree that for Mr. Bart, Mr. Ronnie, well, Dr. Moline certainly agrees that for Mr. Barton, Mr. Ronnie, Mr. Etheridge, and Ms. McNeil, Dr. Moline was talking about Ms. McNeil too, not one of them has any biological evidence of asbestos exposure. Their lungs are clear. Dr. Moline, there's no evidence of asbestosis or plural class on the radiology for any of these individuals. That is correct. Not one of our plaintiffs have any evidence of plural class asbestosis or asbestos body pathology. Dr. Longo claims that they are exposed to millions and millions and billions of fires of asbestos. Why nothing in their lungs? Why all their lungs are clear according to their own expert? Why no biomarkers at all? And when you don't see any biomarkers, when you don't see any evidence of exposure, the experts, Dr. Diaz and Dr. Tanis, concluded this is the kind of cancer that happens unfortunately so many people for no reason at all. And all of us have you know, family members, have suffered through with family members, the horrors of cancer. And it is hard. And that's why sympathy is so hard in cases like this. 
case like this. It's a far too slight case like this. People are really suffering. Right? You all, you know, family members, friends suffer. The truth is, most people get cancer because it just happens. It's not a satisfying excuse. And it's natural to try to find a villain, a reason, a cause. We don't blame the plaintiffs for coming to believe now that this is the reason. It's not. It's the kind of cancer that happens to so many people. We could line the city of New London, but I told you no big, with people suffering from cancer, and those people have nobody to sue. And most of those people have no idea why they die. This cancer that Dr. Attendance explained to you and Dr. It just happens. It's a it's a DNA mistake. And so most of the time our bodies can overcome it, but sometimes not. It just happens. And it happens to good people. And it doesn't mean that J and J is a even though I know most of us would like to find a reason and cause, sometimes it's just a And there's no evidence here that it happened from baby time. There's no evidence. There's no biological markers. There's no testing evidence in their containers. There's no testing expert that they brought you. We tested the final product. Mr. Etheridge diagnosed, you heard Dr. Maddox agree, he's got an extraordinarily rare kind of peritoneal cell. Ask yourself, how the most common of products causes the most uncommon disease. No evidence of asbestos disclosure as long as a tissue. He's, and in his answer to the interrogatories in this case, he talked about three years of diapering uh, being his exposure, uh, and no doctors ever told him that Johnson baby powder caused his I think Dr. Malim said there's something about, oh, well, the use of the last 10 years, and then she acknowledged in his deposition that, was, that wasn't um, sufficient exposure because you need 10 years of war. So three years of diapering is worth 11, 53 years later, with no biomarkers, and none of his doctors told him. So here's Dr. Wood. This is a testimony I was talking about. There are notes that Mr. Etheridge has used talcum powder over the past 10 years when he stopped using the powder in 2016. Do you consider those recent uses a potential cause of this production and use out? Answer, no. Not enough time. So we got three years of exposure uh, which doesn't really add up with the seer data that we looked at in the science. Mr. Borden, we don't believe that Mr. Borden's cancer was caused by asbestos because he's got no evidence, no biological markers. But certainly, if they want to say it's asbestos, the Brooklyn Navy shipyard, there's a lot of science about shipyards in mesothelioma. There's asbestos all over those places, as you heard. You saw so many government reports talking about how much asbestos was there. You know, his father worked not only at the Brooklyn Navy shipyard, but went up and down the eastern seaboard from New York down to New Orleans to Norfolk, Virginia, uh, inspecting Navy ships uh, for making sure they were following the uh, safety guidelines, etc. And it's like, oh, he wore a suit and he worked in an office. But then you saw the studies. If you're walking around those shipyards, if you're on those Navy ships, you're going to get exposure. And you can get secondhand exposure, like secondhand smoke to people in your household and give them these things. You know that Mr. Barton lived with his father and so late his teens before he went to college. And again, no doctor saw. No blame for coming to believe that this is that baby powder was caused. He saw the more advertising suggesting it was trying. Mr. Ronnie, same, no evidence of any exposure to lungs or tissues. And again, none of his doctors. Ms. McNeil, no biological evidence. And for women, you saw 90% of mesos in women are not caused by asbestos. And Ms. McNeil, her recent reports look like, thank goodness, she's doing pretty well. heard from Dr. Brody and from the government that there's asbestos bat and background waste all over in more cities, some in rural areas, and that states with shipyards tend to have higher rates. But there is asbestos in the air. The issue is, is there going to be more than background rate? And that would increase your risk for physical Talk about the FDA. This is from a document you saw in the case of the FDA monitors for potential safety problems with cosmetic products on the market take action needed to protect the public health. And you heard about the citizens' petition. Your Honor, is there a time you want me to stop for lunch? 